from NASA Community College. You can see, also streaming live on the iHeart and the iTunes app. We can be seen in the studios right now on my Facebook live page and the Facebook on WHBC. This program is later archived on Spreaker.com. So hi there, my name is Rabbi Pearl. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. This all depends on when you're listening and watching. And of course, we say hello to all those who are tuning in and those who are watching us right now. I'm going to give out a big shout out, a big wave now to Jonathan Wolf. Good morning to Doug, to Joanne, and uh, to all those who are joining us. And if your name comes up, I'll have a chance to give it a shout out. So today, my friends, I'm focused on the secret of sex. So get out your pens and paper and um, find out what it's all about. And a, a special hello to to uh, Karen and uh, Dr. Kildare is uh, with us today. Good morning to you and to everybody out there. I, uh, I love the connections of numbers and the Torah. You see, because in macro terms, Torah is the blueprint of the universe, of the world. So let's talk today, today about the secret of six. Have this in mind. There's something very special about six. We all know the famous Passover song, Who Knows One, right? Who Knows One? One is God. Two, two are the tablets. Three, three are the forefathers. Four are the matriarchs. Five are the books of Torah. What is six? We say six are the six books of the Mishnah. So what is the difference between Torah and Mishnah? Uh, good morning, of course, to Harvey Kipnis, Mazel Tov Zayda. You, 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 you're fantastic. I'm so happy to know of the great Simcha in your family, Harvey, and looking forward to seeing you during the high holidays. So what is the difference between the Torah and the Mishnah? The Torah is, is the formal written word of God through the pen of Moses. Six represents the oral Torah, which is the compendium of the explanations given to Moshe at, on Sinai. So the six orders of the, the uh, very carefully worded Mishnah is really the foundation of the law expounded upon in the Talmud. Therefore, six represents humankind. Our free will and our contribution to the world of knowledge, which really in, in turn is our partnership in, in, in creation and with the creator of the universe. So have that in mind. We humans are the only creatures blessed with kind of a walking tightrope between the sacred and the profane. So this, right, we, we are the, the bridge between this world, this world of physical, and of course the world of spirituality. So that bridge is represented in the Hebrew letter of the sixth letter, again the number six in the alphabet, the Vav. V-A-V, the Vav. In Hebrew, a Vav is... The word or hook or a connector, like it says, Vove HaMishkan, which symbolizes our unique ability to bridge the heaven and earth. So having that in mind, that each one of us have the ability to bridge, and then Hebrew, it's a letter Vov. The Torah, our instructional manual for greatness, was given to us, here we go, on the sixth day of the month of Sivan. The word six comes up again. Torah was given to us on Vov on Vav Sivan, the sixth day of the month of Sivan. Guess when was man made on the sixth day of creation? On Friday. We have six days each week to strive for greatness, and on the seventh, we turn the reins back to God. So therefore, I want to share with you the following list of six that are the keys to the castle and the time-tested techniques to keep God in our lives. And of course, I would suggest, take a pen and paper out right now, or type it up, and um, to keep these in mind, to memorize them, to, so that we can refer to them at moments of strength and weakness and joy and sorrow and temptation and triumph. So imagine each item that I share with you now are the corners of the six-pointed Jewish star the Mug and David, the Star of David, with yourself in the middle. Are we ready? 
Meanwhile, I want to say hello to Sean. Welcome, Sean. Nice to hear. Thank you for joining us today. Sean is our station manager. He's in, in charge of this great, great station here at Nass Community College. And we thank you, Sean, and everybody here that makes us uh, look good here every week and to have the opportunity to share. And now we're in the middle of the summer, so it's time to prepare ourselves. And I'm thinking about the number six, how the number six in the Hebrew letter is the letter Vav. Vav means a hook. And there's, some, there's a, a way to connect with the number of six, and they are representative of the six constant mitzvahs. There are what we call sheish mitzvahs tamidia, six constant mitzvahs. See, like, let's say, for example, there's a mitzvah which are time-bound, like shaking the lulav or making kiddush on Shabbos. So there has a time and place for these particular things. But there are six things that we observe 24-7 that are in our mind at all times. And in a sense, these six represent the six directions that we typically live in. There is, of course, the four directions around us, above and below. And we keep these six things in mind. We create kind of a divine space. So let's go. What are these six? First is to know there is a God. As we learn, we know God took us out of Egypt. This mitzvah is derived from the first of the Ten Commandments. To know, not just to believe, that God exists. God created the universe and stuck around to supervise and maintain it. God is continuously involved in our personal lives. It's up to each of us to fully investigate the evidence so that we are unequivocally convinced that God's presence is absolutely real. Then we have to take, the, 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 take that knowledge on the road and, of course, live our lives accordingly. And sharing, of course, the good news. So that's number one. The second thing to keep in mind don't believe in any other gods. Do not recognize any gods. God is everywhere. There's no power except God. Not your boss, not your parents, and guess what? Not even the President of the United States of America. So while modern universe and modern society is not driven to worship statutes and planets like our ancestors, we are prone to place our faith in technology, government, fame, and fortune. So don't do it. Number three, know that God is one. Here, here, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Lekein, Hashem Echad. Not only do we utter the six-word formula twice a day, morning and night, we must constantly keep in mind the essential lesson of God's uniqueness and unity. If God is all that exists, then we are inside God, a part of God. We are part of God's whole personality. So God created time and space, and therefore, beyond time and space, both at the same time. So God is indivisible. Therefore, what is our constant thought? God is right, right here, right now, and all the time, and always. Number four is loving God. Love God with all your heart. If we appreciate that God is the source of everything, and nothing is owed to us, all of our gifts inspire immense gratitude and love. Number five in our six secrets. Be in awe of God. Revere God and serve God. What is that? A constant awareness of God's presence results in a perpetual state of awe. God is awesome, right? The term used today. Revering implies we understand that actions have consequences. We know that challenging the law of gravity is foolish. Judaism teaches that spiritual realities are just as real. So this constant mitzvah keeps us on the right track, knowing that God is lovingly aware of all of our moves. And we shared this weekend in our shul at Chabad of Mineola, how does a person keep, keep that consciousness of God at all times? It's very simple. Is by making blessings over food. Even going, going to the bathroom. When we come out of the bathroom, there's a blessing to say. That brings, brings holiness. It brings an appreciation that the plumbing is still working. And many other blessings as well. Before we sit down and eat, we make a blessing. All of this helps us to bring the God's awareness in every aspect of our life. Number six of these six secrets is don't stray after your desires. Don't follow your hearts or your eyes after which you astray. 
which really means we must keep our eye on the goal and not get distracted by emotional, heart or physical eye temptations. We constantly are besieged by obstacles that derail our lives. This constant mitzvah urges us to learn that these traps look and feel and feel like, but when attempted, they're taking us away from where we should be. Therefore, we must always recognize that we have a soul and how do the right thing. So next time you're stuck in line, where whatever it may be, review these six mitzvahs. And I would like to share with you a handy acronym to memorize them is FLUKES. FLUKES, F-L-O-O-K-S. F stands for fear. L, love. O, one. Other, no, and stray. FLUKES. Let me say hello now to uh, Susan Ferenzi. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, Susan is actually watching us from Israel. Wow. Mazel tov. Susan is in Israel now celebrating her grandson's bar mitzvah. To Patty Fuchs, good morning. To Sean, thank you again. Harold Kornfeld from Florida. Wow. Fantastic. Thank you, Jonathan Wolf from New Jersey, giving us an insight on the letter Vov. And good morning to Isa. Uh, Isa. Klein, I think he's from Israel too. And also good morning to Zalman Wan. Fantastic. So keep it coming, everybody. And we're discussing how there's a secret of six. In our lives, six is a very significant number. The Torah is given on the sixth day of the week, on the sixth day of the month of Sivan. We have six days to work, and we have six missioners. And there's also six remembrances as well. The six things to keep in mind uh, as well. In many of the uh, prayer books, each um, and some actually have the custom of, of saying it every day, there's a six, six events that we are commanded to remember at all times to ensure our future. What are the things that we should keep in mind every day? The exodus from Egypt. This mitzvah is typically fulfilled well, in the morning and night when we say the Shema. This, of course, this remembrance is the first on the list because it keeps keeps it in top of mind that crucial aspect of gratitude to God, Exodus from Egypt. We were redeemed, and that continues on every single day. The second thing to have in mind is there was an event at Mount Sinai, and that still impacts us. Not only were we saved from slavery, we were brought to receive the Torah at Mount Sinai, which is the climax of human history. A great gift, a great inheritance, Guess what? Over two million people witnessed this event and made sure to share this drama with all the subsequent generations in perpetuity. And that's what we're doing here today. Number three is Amalekites. Remember the Amalekites, what, how they attacked. Do not forget. Sadly, anti-Semitism is the world's oldest hatred. It all began with the Amalekites and has continued in various forms to this present day. Therefore, we must remain vigilant we must never assume our efforts towards peace will pacify this vile, irrational force. The fourth thing to keep in mind is the golden calf. Remember what happened. Sadly, we were at the top of our game, standing proudly at Mount Sinai, just having crossed the Red Sea. And God, right, we came out of Egypt. We, were about, uh, we received the Torah at Mount Sinai. And then to some uh, poor calculations, we lost faith, assumed our leader was dead, that's Moses, and guess what? Built an idol. So we were so close to victory. What is the lesson, of course? At the cusp of greatness, we're in the most danger of falling. The bigger they are, the harder they fall, as we know the saying is. Some call this syndrome fear of success. We must go for greatness, filled with confidence. That said... When we approach our goals, we must be remain humble and grounded, never arrogant or cocky in any way. Then there's number five, Miriam's punishment. Remember what God did to Miriam on the journey when we left Egypt. What was that all about? Well, remember, we're discussing these six things to remember every single day. Miriam was Moses' biggest sister. She was a great prophetess, a leader. Even she was vulnerable to the snare of Gossip, Lush and horror. And as a result, she contracted a spiritual skin disease known as Saras. 
How much more do we, regular folk, need to be careful to guard our tongues, to ensure our words sow harmony and not discord? I give out what's going on today. How careful if people would hold their tongues. Sticks and stones can break my bones, and names can hurt me. The Talmud teaches that embarrassing someone is like shedding blood. That's how serious it is. This remembrance helps us exercise care regarding our power to bring blessing or curse to the world. We call it in Hebrew, Shmiras Haloshan, guarding one's tongue, which really is the foundation stone of our unity, of of a, of a sane society. The sixth thing is to celebrate Shabbat. What's the significance of celebrating the Shabbat? Why is this the final remembrance in the key of these six six things to remember? I mean, why should this be? It's only, only uh, once a week. You see, the truth is the mitzvah of Shabbat, remembering Shabbos, can be done daily. In the following manner, you set aside special foods, you buy, you find a special food, don't eat it on Monday or Tuesday or Thursday, keep it for Shabbos. Oh, you bought a nice suit, wear it first time for Shabbos. When you invite guests and you plan festival meals, all this can be done in honor of Shabbat. And that is, make Shabbat the center of the week rather than the finish line. I often say, in our world, we don't have a weekend Because Shabbat is so important, it's really the inspiration for the entire week. So Shabbat really is a taste of Olam Abba, of the world to come. This remembrance brings, reminds us and brings us that we can live all the time. We can experience this heaven on earth, as we learned earlier on, the importance of the six constant mitzvahs, where human beings are the only ones that connect physical and spiritual. Think about this as parents to children, to impacting the world with good deeds. This is something that all of us, only us, only, only all the human beings have the ability to have a, a lasting impact on the world around us in a much more meaningful way. So if you want to remember these, these six things, let's call it MIGAS. MIGAS. Uh, M stands for Miriam. E stands for Egypt. G stands for Golden. A stands for Amalek, Sinai, and Shabbat. So while I'm still on with the number six, I'd like to share with you what happens when a person arrives up in heaven. Um, the Talmud tells us that we're actually asked six questions. Like this is a census, or the, you know, there's a like a census taking. Every person is asked the six questions. Before we do that, I want to say again hello to all those who are watching us on Facebook, as well as um, those listening on WHBC. And I do appreciate your time today, and I hope your summer is going well, even as it's winding down. So what are the six questions? Again, we're, in, we're into number six today. And uh, What are the six uh, questions that a person is asked when they arrive up in heaven? Take it easy, everybody. Take it easy. You're not going to be asked what your password is or your uh, user code, uh, either for your Facebook account or even your bank account. Guess what? Let me share with you. What are the six questions a person is asked? The Talmud tells us. After 120 amazing years on earth, a person arrives in heaven and will face, face these questions. So our entrance exam, according to the Talmud, consists of six crucial questions. As you'll see, each demonstrates reaching a lofty level of maturity and going beyond the call of duty in our life's work. The idea is to nail all six, (laughs) nail them down, get them right, before we meet our maker. Now, you won't believe what number one is. Did we do business with honesty and integrity? Did we cheat in sacred? Assuming no one would know any better. Were we afraid of public shame, but uncaring about God's perspective? Were we givers or takers? Were we exacting with our calculations? Did we nurture our employees? So the first question asked on the entrance exam to heaven is, did you do business with honesty, integrity? 
I always thought about this is amazing. You would think that the first question would be some sort of a spiritual uh, perspective. Nope. It's about how did you, were you a mensch? How was your interaction with people around you, especially with honesty, integrity in business? Number two, did we set aside fixed times for studying Torah? Did we recognize the benefit of regular Torah study? Did we live a disciplined life with emphasis given to matters of spirit? Were we dedicated to personal growth? Did we share the sweetness of Torah? So this is a little more, more personal now. Did a person fill their life with meaningful study? Fascinating. Oh, let's move on to number three. Number three is, did we participate in the commandment to be fruitful and multiply? What does that mean? Did we see ourselves as a link on the ongoing chain of humanity? Or do we remain, so to speak, stagnant? Did we become selfless through the experience of child rearing? Did we assist others in their efforts to marry and be blessed with families? That's very, fa- very. We could go on in great length of the significance of the order of these questions, but this is how the Talmud tells us. So again, it's the first thing is to did did we deal business? Did we do business with honesty, integrity? Did we set aside fixed times for studying? Did we participate in the commandment to be fruitful and multiply? Number four, number four, is did we anxiously await the redemption? What does that mean? Do we have an optimistic outlook on life? Do we live only for the moment or are we preparing for the future? Do we engage in the tikkun olam? Do we engage in making the world and picking up the sparks of holiness? Did we place our faith in God to better our lot? Number five, did we engage in the pursuit of wisdom? This is a fascinating question. Were we absorbed with mindless time wasters or we engage with an outlook of life of growth that I want to be a better person? Did we ask questions and seek answers? Do we challenge the status quo of our life? Do we just simply, well, I made it. I made it to this age. I'm on the plateau. Forget about it. There's nothing else I'm going to do anymore. Did we share the knowledge that we gained? Did we nurture a broad intellectual curiosity? And number six, my friends, is we'll be asked, did we have the awe of heaven? Did we have an awareness of God in our everyday lives? Did we appreciate God's amazing world? Did we recognize God's exacting, you know, recognition and watching over us? So we are lucky because, <laughs> right, when you go for a test, you have no idea what the question is going to be when you go for your SATs. But we are lucky. Our teacher has given us the test questions in advance. And I, again, I'd like to, uh, in order to keep them on top of your mind to be able to answer these questions confidently think of the word WARFS W-H-A-R-F-S W stands for wisdom H stands for honesty A stands for all R stands for redemption Geula redemption Mashiach F stands for fruitful and of course S is for savings no S stands for study you know how to judge, oh, let me say hello now to any those who are joining us here again on, on uh, Facebook. Hello to Laura May. Laura, how are you doing, Laura? I'm my best to Jonathan, Jonathan Big and Jonathan Small. We look forward to seeing you soon on the high holidays. So um, just to wrap this up, my friends, um, one of the things that in general that uh, I strive hard for is not to be a judgmental person. The great Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, the great Talmudical sage and leader, once sent his students out into the world to ascertain what's the best advice for living a righteous and fulfilling life. So one of his students, Rabbi Eliezer, returned from his travels and he said, I have searched and I found that the best advice is to develop an eye in toiv, a good eye. When your eye, your lens on life is good, what you see will be good, no matter what. Of course, the opposite is also true. Therefore, 
It is of paramount importance to work on developing the capacity to see God and the good in all. This is the essence of a good eye. So you see, when you view the world in such a way, you will tend to find positive interpretations of events and experiences, as well as judge others in the most favorable light. Every human being possesses, we all have this capacity for a redemptive vision. But achieving and maintaining it requires effort. One area in particular that benefits from an eye in toif, when a person goes around life with a good eye, there's a benefit that in personal relationships, whether at work or within the family or community, interpersonal relationships are complicated and messy, as we all know. As we each have very different views, definitions, associations, narratives, word choices, eikevalt, insecurities, projections. So we create near constant opportunities for misunderstanding and to be judgmental. I often joke that our synagogue is north of Old Country Road. Old Country Road in Mineola, south, is filled with all the, uh, all the courts. I said, let them do all the judging. Up in our shul, in our Chabad house of Mineola, it's not a place of judgment. When we speak with others, we're often unconsciously importing energies of our previous encounters. We sometimes carry over the residue of the resents- resentments from the past. In any conversation or encounter, there is a possibility for misappropriation of meaning and intent. Guess this gives rise to unnecessary skepticism. Skeptic becomes skeptical and ultimately sadly suspicious of others. A person can easily fall into a default mode in which they immediately assume the worst about people. Imagine how positive and kind our daily encounters could be if we could adopt a good eye and condition ourselves to view others more generously. Imagine a world which the baseline of human interaction is to give them the benefit of the doubt. Such a world would draw forth and activate this inherent kindness of our nature in a very never-ending loop of, really, of reinforcement. Therefore, it is important to remember there's always more than one way to view a person. The Baal Shem the founder of the Hasidic movement, taught, you see what is inside of you. Therefore, the more you condition yourself to look for the good in others, the more good in others you will see. The good news is that you that each of us can rewire our neurological pathways and shift our patterns of perception to focus on the positive in others. So with practice, we can actually re- reconfigure and how we approach others and how we interrupt, interpret our interactions with others, leading us to the development of a what I would call a positivity bias. Of course, which allows us to be more present to receive others with greater understanding, empathy, and with trust. So, my friends, this is your host, Rabbi Pearl. Thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful week, and wishing you, as we're now getting close to the new month of Elul, a very happy, healthy, and sweet new year. Thank you so much. Zai gesund.